The webinar will begin shortly. Please remain on the line. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the November public meeting. I'm Linda Muma, a public information officer with CalRecycle. If you haven't tuned in for a while, we've made some changes to the format of our public meetings to serve the public better with communication that is accessible, inclusive, and plain language as possible. And we welcome your feedback as we continue to make improvements to our public meetings. Before we get started this morning, a quick mention to those who wish to submit questions and comments on an agenda item to please send them to the public comments portal. You can find the portal on the CalRecycle homepage from the top menu bar, select Get Involved, and then Public Meeting. In the text near the bottom of the page, click Public Comment Portal. And then from the drop down menu, select the first option, Monthly Public Meeting, to type your name, your email address, subject or agenda item, and then submit your question or comment. Please keep the, the agenda specific and brief, and we'll address your comments during the public comment period a little bit later this morning. Our first agenda item today is the director's report. Director Rachel Maki Wagner joins us and updates this morning. Good morning, Rachel. Good morning, Linda, and thank you so much for that kickoff this morning. It is so wonderful to be with everybody today. Um, I absolutely love anniversaries, and today is the 24th, or yesterday was the 24th anniversary of America Recycles today. America Recycles. We look um, through our anniversaries as an opportunity to look back at where we came from and where we are going. As we look at California and our recycling efforts, we can be very proud of what we've been able to accomplish. Through recycling, we reduce waste, we conserve our natural resources, our water, our air, our timber, and our minerals. We save tons and tons of energy, and we prevent pollution in our air, water, and land every single day when we recycle. To date, we have removed millions of tons of plastics, aluminum, glass, and other materials from the waste stream. We have created hundreds of thousands of jobs in this country around the recycling market, and we have generated billions and billions of dollars in wages for the American economy. We can be very successful, of, we can be very proud of the successes that we've been able to achieve, yet there is still so much more to do. In California, we are still disposing of over 48 million tons of materials each year. That is over six pounds per resident per day. Together though, we can close the loop in building a circular economy. Today we are announcing some very, very exciting opportunities through CalRecycle that will help to close that loop in building the circular economy here in California together. Most importantly, we must work together. You will hear about our efforts on implementation of SB 619 by Senator John Laird, who, which will help California and our jurisdictions work together to implement our organics recycling programs. You will also hear about our organic grants recovery program, which is one of my all time favorite programs because this is a place where we take and put back to the highest possible use edible food that would have otherwise been disposed of. I am very excited to talk today about everything from debris removal to recycling as California moves forward on implementing these incredibly important programs. We are also embarking on increased funding for our RMDZ program. And we last week held a workshop for the RMDZ jurisdictions that was an incredible an incredible workshop of all of the zone administrators as well as CalRecycle staff really highlighting how RMDC can help build the recycling markets and the remanufacturing markets in here in California. And so with that, Linda, I'd like to turn it back over to you for the video. California faces a worsening climate crisis and a growing problem of trash pollution in our community. And unfortunately, global demand for uh, all resources uh, will, are projected to double by 2050. At this rate, our oceans will have more plastic 
than fish. We have the power to take on these challenges and create successful businesses with more green jobs as we innovate our way to a zero waste circular economy for the state of California. We are creating this Office of Innovation in Market Development and Remanufacturing, which will serve as a one-stop shop helping new and expanding existing businesses navigate state regulations and all the incentives offered by various state agencies from the treasury to, to go biz and loan programs and grants. California is an environmental leader and an industry innovator. We must look at how we live and conduct our business to lessen our contribution to climate change and adapt to become more resilient to restore and rebuild our environment and the economies that are reliant on it. Manufacturing is wasteful. Consumerism is wasteful. We need to change how we produce, consume, and dispose of resources. And this linear economy is perpetuating an unsustainable system. On the other hand, a circular economic system seeks to close that loop on our take-make-waste value chains, and it reinvents the way that we produce and consume. Working together, we can move from a disposable system where most items are used just once then thrown into a landfill forever to a circular one where we collect and reuse. Chambers can uh, embrace this opportunity. They can uh, put on innovation expos. They can uh, target few extruders in, in, the, in their community and see what they're doing on the front end to uh, manufacturing something that's gonna last a lot longer. By building the circular economy here in California, it will help us recover from the pandemic stronger and more resilient. Businesses are defining ambitious circular strategies for implementation in a short time frame in the next five to 10 years. Consumers and regulators are both increasingly demanding a move towards circularity as well. With technical and financial assistance from CalRecycle, Businesses across the state are designing waste out of their manufacturing process and using materials from local curbside bins to create new products. Together, we can make sure manufacturing is a part of our recycling and waste system so that everything we use is designed to be used again. Thank you so much for those important updates, Rachel, and it was a great conversation on that webinar. Now to an update on wildfire disaster recovery efforts. CalRecycle crews are making significant progress in clearing family homes destroyed by the 2021 wildfires. Doug Thorley of Colfax lost his home in the river fire. He's seeing debris cleared from his property much earlier than expected. This has been really good. And, uh, and I actually didn't really think that it would happen much before Thanksgiving. And so we're definitely ahead of that curve. And as one program is underway, the state has met a major milestone in paradise with the felling of the final hazard tree from the campfire. Deputy Director Tina Walker is here now to tell us the significance of this milestone. Good morning, Tina. Good morning. Thank you, Linda. The Campfire Hazard Tree Removal Program was the first of its kind for CalRecycle, in fact, for the state. Although structural debris removal completed in November 2019, there remained hundreds of thousands of damaged trees posing potential threat to public safety along roadways, parks, and other public and community facilities. To complete the work, local, state, and federal partners worked together to develop new policies and approaches necessary to properly identify and safely fell fire damaged hazard trees within this community. These practices have since become part of our standard operating procedures, benefiting each of our subsequent missions. Thank you to the CalRecycle staff and all of the public and private partners who have worked so diligently for three years so that survivors can finally come home and rebuild their lives. Again, to all involved, thank you for your commitment to this mission and your monumental efforts to help California recovery efforts. It truly is greatly appreciated. The 2020 statewide disaster debris removal operation has concluded in Bay, Inland, and South branches. North Branch operations has completed structural debris removal and tree felling operations will continue through the end of the year. The 2021 disaster debris removal operation has been underway since early October and was the quickest and most efficient mobilization and deployment of resources to date. 
CalRecycle was in fact mission tasked to respond to the impacts of eight fires across 10 counties before fires were fully contained. And in the first two weeks of structural debris removal operations, the crews were able to clear over 200 parcels. Since then, CalRecycle has been mission tasked with seven additional fire events and an additional structural debris and hazard tree removal contract is now being advertised to ensure those additional crews will be in the field and operating by mid-December. Disaster debris removal is perhaps the most tangible barrier to recovering and rebuilding after a wildland fire. We spoke to a family in Colfax about the progress on clearing what remains of their home. This is great, like, and for it to be now and not even the end of December, because I had, at one point somebody had said, oh yeah, we're hoping to be done with everything by the end of the year. And so I kind of mentally was like, oh, okay, so it'll happen, you know, in the couple of weeks leading up to Christmas. And so it's great that there's action happening now. CalRecycle continues to look for ways to improve and expedite disaster recovery efforts in California. And one of our efforts includes the development and solicitation of a master services agreement for field assessment and monitoring of disaster damaged properties. We're really excited to um, hold a bidders conference today from one to three on this master services agreement. So if you're interested in more information or participating, please visit the Department of General Services website at calepurecure.ca.gov. We'll see you then, thank you. Thanks so much for that, Tina. Uh, moving on now to Senate Bill 1383 and an update there. In just six weeks, California's new organic waste recycling and surplus food recovery law takes effect statewide. The implementation of Senate Bill 1383 is one of the fastest and easiest ways that Californians can fight climate change and move the state towards a circular economy with less pollution and more green jobs. Policy Director Zoe Heller joins us now with some new resources for jurisdictions. Good morning, Zoe. Good morning, Linda. Since the law's passage in 2016, California jurisdictions have made so much progress implementing local programs to collect and recycle waste and, and rescue surplus meals for hungry neighbors in the community. The recent passage of SB 619 offers a new compliance pathway for jurisdictions that are not prepared to meet these new requirements on January 1st. The law provides jurisdictions an opportunity to submit a notice of intent to comply with SB 1383 to CalRecycle. The department just published this webpage to help jurisdictions through the process. This Thursday at 9 a.m., CalRecycle will host a webinar detailing the requirements for jurisdictions to submit a notice of intent to comply with the SB 1383 regulations. We'll cover the submission and approval requirements and end with a question and answer session. You can take part in the webinar by registering on this GoToWebinar link, or you can watch the webcast from this CalRecycle broadcast link. For additional information or to submit questions ahead of time, you can email noic at calrecycle.ca.gov. As a reminder, we are continually updating and adding information and resources to our short-lived climate pollutant page. To ensure you're notified of the latest updates, please sign up for the SLCP listserv. Please continue to reach out to CalRecycle for any technical assistance regarding SB 1383. We're available for meetings and presentations. Thanks so much, Zoe. To cut landfill climate emissions and help feed the one in five Californians who don't have enough to eat, Senate Bill 1383 requires local governments to redirect still fresh surplus meals to neighbors in need. As part of California's latest $270 million in circular economy investments, CalRecycle just opened applications for $2.8 million in new grant funding for local edible food recovery projects. Take a look at this short video on how local food rescue projects make a difference in our communities. Preventing food from rotting in landfills is one of the fastest, most effective ways California can fight climate change. Every year, our state throws away about 1.8 billion unsold still fresh meals. During COVID, hunger tripled in California. Now, one in five Californians don't have enough to eat. To cut waste that causes landfill methane emissions, 
California's climate law going into effect on January 1st requires wholesalers, grocery stores, and other food businesses to donate their surplus, still fresh food to Californians in need. What we do is we go ahead and collect all the donations available throughout here in the LA area and in the growing areas in Southern California. We aggregate and consolidate it and create mixed loads of produce to our recipient agencies. CalRecycle's food recovery grants have already directed 142 million meals to Californians in need since they started in 2018. In 2018. CalRecycle's new edible food recovery grant program is a little different than previous CalRecycle investments in the food rescue and food waste prevention space. Deputy Director Matt Hedigan is here with the eligibility and award criteria for this new grant program. Good morning, Matt. Good morning, Linda. Thank you so much. Um, our, 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 our edible food recovery grant program is part of Governor Newsom's California Comeback Plan. Uh, and the latest budget investments um, are part of a $15 billion climate package, uh, which includes $270 million to support the circular economy. Um, so California's Food Waste Prevention and Rescue Grant Program uh, traditionally had been funded with cap and trade proceeds. Uh, and since 2018, that resulted in $24 million to 80 local government, nonprofit, school and university projects, 142 uh, million fresh meals rescued and fed to Californians in need, uh, reduced climate emissions equal to taking 34,000 cars off the road for a year, and 394 local jobs collecting, storing, transporting, and distributing the surplus food. Um, this year, the Edible Food Recovery Grant is funded through a general fund appropriation. And that change from GGRF funding, greenhouse gas reduction funding, to general fund allowed us to re-examine our approach to how we evaluate and rank these projects. In doing so, staff was able to simplify the application process and consider new metrics for ranking. And in this round of grants, we are focused on increasing capacity to recover surplus food, targeting the most food insecure communities, and prioritizing qualifying tribal communities. Uh, so changes have been made. If you're a prior grantee, I encourage you to read through the RFA that you can, there, this is a, called a request for action, uh, that's attached to today's agenda for all the detail on how CalRecycle addressed these priorities in the grant criteria and application ranking process. Um, some of the changes that you'll want to note are that food waste prevention projects must also include a food rescue and redistribution component. For example, a project to modernize food ordering, production, and handling practices to reduce the preparation waste is still eligible, but that same project also must include a food recovery component that recovers edible food that would have been destined for landfills and redistributes it to feed people. Uh, you'll also see that for-profit businesses are no longer an eligible applicant, but they can still be hired by grantees to do the transporting and storing and other, other work of the grant. They just are not direct elig directly eligible applicants. Um, and we were also giving funding priority to tribal organizations and uh, particularly food insecure communities. Um, some of the typical eligible expenses that the grant could cover and have covered in the past are refrigerated refrigerators, refrigerated trucks, food preparation equipment. Um, things like salaries, software, public education are eligible but will be capped at a certain percentage of the total grant award. Um, there is $2.8 million available this fiscal year and another $1.9 million are available next fiscal year. The maximum grant award is $150,000 and the max, uh, I'm sorry, so when you're thinking about the scope of your project, keep in mind that the minimum grant award is $150,000 and that the maximum grant award is $250,000. So try to stay within that scope. Um, applications are due December 16th, but the question and answer period closes uh, in, I believe it's November 22nd. So get those questions in as soon as you can. Um, thank you. 
uh, moving on to uh, our next grant program. This is another brand new uh, piece of the $270 million package, uh, circular economy package. This $57 million in grant funds will be available to cities, counties, and special districts that provide solid waste collection services. These are the folks who have to respond to SB 1383. Uh, our team is seeking public comment on the proposed criteria for these 1383 local assistant grant program. Um, and we're preparing the grant guidelines and applications now so we can get this money to jurisdictions as soon as possible. So I wanna th express my thanks to the League of California Cities, California State Association of Counties, the rural county representatives of California for already passing along input from the jurisdictions they represent, but if you're from a local jurisdiction and would like to um, share your input on how this grant um, can be most helpful for you, uh, please do email us at this grant at calrecycle.ca.gov by November 19th. So hurry up with those comments. Um, again, a lot more detail is linked from today's agenda. So please find that agenda online and, and, and check out the, the details. Um, some of the proposed uh, uh, eligible projects, which include expenses for personnel, consultants, equipment, vehicles, software, um, and other expenditures um, in areas related to collection, education and outreach, edible food recovery, uh, capacity planning, uh, the pro you know, responding to the procurement requirements, responding to the record keeping requirements, uh, enforcement and inspection, how the local government will enforce and inspect the rules on their, on their um, on, uh, on their businesses um, and program evaluation. So in any of those categories, personnel, consultants, equipment, vehicles, software are eligible expenses. Um, you'll also find some of the guidelines and requirements um, that we are uh, planning to put in on this grant. Um, we're looking at an indirect cost cap of 10% of the total grant award. We're gonna be requiring detailed summaries, letters of authorization, uh, city council resolutions and other application requirements. And I specifically want to note a connection between the grant funds and the adoption of a 1383 enforcement ordinance or other compliant enforcement mechanisms. Those that are able to certify that they will adopt and submit an ordinance to CalRecycle by April 1st will receive funding in the first round. And you know, I'm sure the local governments watching know getting this money earlier is much, much more helpful. Um, that first round is uh, this, this spring of, of 2022. Uh, these awardees may also be eligible for additional remaining funds uh, for, uh, from if any entities don't apply. Applicants who adopt an ordinance after April 1st, the awards are gonna be delayed until next fiscal year. So, um, so keep that in mind. And um, you know, between now and April 1st, uh, local jurisdictions, um, I'm sure have already been working on these compliant enforcement ordinances, but um, if you haven't, um, now's the time. Uh, we've gone through several um, uh, funding scenarios and want to try to make things as equitable as possible. And so, um, you know, we're, 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 we're taking input on the, um, on how to, to handle um, the base amount available to every jurisdiction versus how it should scale based on population. Um, so again, I wanna remind you, resolutions are required for all applicants and we highly recommend you begin, begin preparing them now. Uh, we have examples of those ordinances at, um, at the website listed here, right? calrecycle.ca.gov, funding, sample documents. Um, take a look at the text and ensure it includes um, permission to apply for all CalRecycle Cal grants, right? Getting one resolution that covers all of these grants would be helpful. Um, and if you're applying as a regional or JPA, you'll need letters of authorization in your grant program, in your grant application. Uh, we anticipate the application will be released in January 2022 and due in February. Awards should be announced in April with the first batch of jurisdictions. Uh, and um, awards will be sent in the next fiscal year for jurisdictions that adopt an ordinance after April 1st, 2022. Um, so I know that was a lot to digest if you're a local government. I think you, you, you're able to track that. Um, 
And, and I do want to remind everyone that if you do have questions or uh, comments, you can um, you can input uh, your comments at the public comment portal uh, or send your uh, right. And we, uh, if you have input on the grant specifically, please email us at grants at calrecycle.ca.gov. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, and moving on to our last uh, grant item of the day, uh, we are announcing over half a million dollars in new awards under our farm and ranch solid waste cleanup and abatement grant program. Uh, this program offers $1 million annually to communities and tribes to help clear and prevent illegal dumping on farm and ranch land. Um, it includes other types of rural properties as well. So if it's not necessarily a farm or a ranch, don't, don't be scared off. Um, this grant cycle, we received seven applications for $579,000 in funding. You can see the grant recipients here on the slide. Uh, funds can be used to restore these lands as well as install signage and fencing to prevent future dumping. They also often install cameras and things like that for these dumping hotspots. Since 1997, Cal Recycle has awarded over $13 million to help clear more than 1,000 sites like this of things like tire, apl tires, appliances, vehicles, construction debris, and other trash. Um, and th these farm and ranch applications, um, uh, we almost always have one coming up. There is a new deadline in a couple of days, uh, November 18th, but if your jurisdiction could benefit from these, um, you know, apply this round or the next round will, will come along. I think we do this one three times a year. Uh, and and, and in, the, in the spirit of encouraging you to apply for farm and ranch grants, there are several other open grant applications that I just want to remind you of are tire-derived aggregate grants. Uh, this program funds projects that use recycled tires as an alternative to conventional civil engineering uh, fill materials like gravel, or pumice, um, for things like stormwater infiltration galleries, landfill slide repairs, and other public works that need lightweight aggregate. Uh, those applications are due December 8th, so if you're from a public works department and you're doing something that uses aggregate, uh, you know, please partner with Cal Recycle to get some of those costs covered. Um, funding to support beverage container recycling and litter reduction is available through our city-county payment program. Every city and county should apply for that one. Those applications are due January 18th. Uh, applications for our solid waste disposal and co-disposal site cleanup program are due February 1st. Under that program, local governments can finance a wide range of remediation projects at illegal dump sites or old dumps and landfills. And finally, uh, applications for our recycling market development zones to get their zone incentive funds are due on March 1st of 2022. And if you run an RMDZ, I'm sure you are well aware of that. Uh, okay, well, thank you all and I look forward to any questions or comments that come in via the portal or through our grants at CalRecycle. Uh, that's the that go uh, email. Uh, passing it back to Linda. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, innovation is what California does best, and the state plays an important role in establishing the foundation of a circular remanufacturing economy in California. With technical and financial assistance from CalRecycle, businesses across the state are designing waste out of their manufacturing process and using materials from local curbside bins to create new products. Take a look at how some Central Valley businesses are bringing jobs to their communities while turning millions of tons of California's waste into new products. The surge in single-use disposable trash is overwhelming our ocean and our landfills. We take from Mother Earth, right, we make the product and then we dispose of it. Each year, California throws away 42 million tons of waste. That's equal to shipping containers stacked more than 32 bins high running the entire length of Interstate 5. It's an alarming reality for Frank Farrell with the Stockton Chamber of Commerce. The linear way of doing things, we have to throw out the window because we're just throwing way too much material away. Rather than dump our discards overseas where recyclable materials often end up landfilled or in the ocean, California is working to make sure items are recycled by building remanufacturing right here in our state. It has to be done. 
because we, we're just throwing way too much stuff you know, in, in the hole. California businesses are leading the way, remaking our economy to reuse materials. We do not throw anything away. Waste is not part of the business model for Epic Plastics. Every bottle counts. And every bottle that we put back into products, that basically gets a second chance in life. Since 1998, the Northern California company has kept over 200 million pounds of old milk jugs and other plastic from becoming trash pollution, creating jobs by remanufacturing single-use disposable packaging into something new. This is our finished product of the Bend the Board. It is designed to go underground, basically concealed for your landscape edging. And when the recycled edging lives out its useful life, it's recycled again. It's going to get a second chance in life and uh, it's going to become products that people can use. A circular economy model that reduces waste and pollution by growing green businesses that safeguard the health and well-being of their communities. We have all kinds of safety procedures and process. Under California's strict environmental standards, recycling businesses use technology and best practices to keep neighborhoods clean and keep traffic, odor, and noise pollution in check. Like this Recology compost facility in the Central Valley that has kept two million tons of waste out of landfills. It's going to help reduce methane generation to help our climate problem. Um, also, it controls odors better because now they have biofiltration. Improving communities by transforming local economies with green jobs. We're hiring like crazy. Central Valley based Ecologic needs more workers to keep up with rising demand for their recycled paper bottles. A lot of the big packaging companies kind of, you know, didn't really think my idea was legitimate because in 2008 to I'd say 2012 or 13, a lot of people really thought that sustainability was just a trend. In January, one of the world's largest contract manufacturers acquired the company and has plans to take this California innovation global. So they're going to be making ecologic bottles in Europe, um, you know, by the end of uh, 2022. California wants to help more businesses realize the benefits of a renewable system. I think the circular economy, I think it's going to stimulate innovation. Look at the design of your product on the front end. Uh, what can you do to uh, redesign it so it can be repurposed or recycled to put back into another product or continue the lifespan of your existing product? He sees the state's latest $270 million in new circular economy investments as a potential boon for local growth. So what I think we've done and what the governor has done uh, through the signing of a, a slew of legislation, you know, that support the circular economy has enabled the business community and all chambers to really work with this, but changing the paradigm a little bit and uh, looking at it differently. Providing local communities with a roadmap to a zero waste future. Literally, if you look behind me, there's about 1.3, 1.4 million pounds of trash in this yard that would have ended up in our landfill. With millions in new state funds available and seven new laws moving recycling forward. I believe other companies can do this. California is investing in businesses that have the vision to jump to the next level of economic growth that will keep thriving into the future. And as Matt mentioned earlier, California's latest budget investments or invests over $270 million to accelerate the state's move to a circular economy. Funding over the next two years include $165 million for food and yard waste recycling infrastructure, which includes the Senate Bill 1383 local assistance funding Matt also mentioned earlier. It also includes $75 million to raise the demand for recyclables and attract a green industry to California with CalRecycle's new Office of Innovation in Recycling and Remanufacturing, $5 million to expand food waste prevention and surplus food recovery projects, as Matt mentioned, the first edible food recovery grant cycle is open right now. Another five million to expand community composting programs that increase air cleansing, green spaces, and recycle food waste in disadvantaged communities. And $20 million to upgrade wastewater treatment plants that turn food waste into clean energy. Look for announcements and updates from CalRecycle as these funding opportunities become available. And as a reminder, if you'd like to submit a question or a comment on an agenda item, please do so through the public comments portal. You can see the instructions there on your screen. From the CalRecycle homepage, select public meeting 
in the text, click on public meeting portal, and then in the drop down menu, select monthly public meeting and make sure to include your name, your email address, and subject or agenda item. And also, please keep your submissions brief and make sure to indicate which agenda item you are addressing so that Zoe and Maria can make sure that they are uh, redirect or, or directing them to the correct person during the public comment period coming up just a little bit later. Now to an update on, calorie, on California's beverage container recycling program, which helped California recycle over 426 billion containers since the bottle bill passed in 1986. Deputy Director Amy Cameron joins us now with how the department works to safeguard the funds consumers pay when purchasing CRV beverages. Good morning, Amy. Good morning, thank you, Linda. CalRecycle works diligently to prevent and combat fraud perpetrated against the California Beverage Container Recycling Fund with robust internal monitoring, reviews, inspections, and investigations. We also partner with other state agencies to stop criminal groups from bringing out-of-state beverage containers into California for redemption. Since consumers outside of the state don't pay the nickel or dime on CRV beverage purchases, these materials are not eligible for CRV refunds. To help prevent out-of-state recycling fraud, California law requires importers to submit an imported materials report, otherwise known as an IMR, to document any time they bring in more than 25 pounds of aluminum, bimetal, or plastic empty beverage containers, or more than 250 pounds of glass beverage containers. Anyone importing 25 or more pounds of any empty beverage container material must get a proof of inspection from one of the 16 California Department of Food and Agricultural Inspection checkpoints located along California's borders. It is against the law for drivers to circumvent these checkpoints or fail to stop for load inspections. CalRecycle's data analysis and risk evaluation unit then processes these reports, which totals nearly 37,000 imported material reports since the program started in 2014. Staff review the data and act on any suspicious activity by following up with the driver or the receiver of the materials. Our staff may also refer suspicious activity to CalRecycle's enforcement partners at the California Department of Justice. These report requirements provide a framework for California and its partners to stop and punish those who try to defraud the CRV fund. Here is a look at the historical trends for IMR submissions with about 6,600 submitted in 2014. We saw a slight uptick in 2016 and a steady decline once China banned most imports of recyclable materials. Up until that point, many of those loads were exported from California ports. For the past four years, CalRecycle received between 200 to 300 IMRs a month. In the past year, our team processed 3,100 reports or an average of 257 per month. 24 states and two countries were listed as importing into California. Nevada, Arizona, and Washington were the top three importers comprising 81.2% of the IMRs and 82.3% of the total weight. As I mentioned, the California Department of Food and Agriculture is a key partner in this fraud prevention program as agents collect the imported materials report from drivers and complete subsequent proof of inspection forms. Calvary Cycle and its enforcement partners at DOJ offer regular training and site visits at these border checkpoints. CDFA also partners with the Department of Justice and Calvary Cycle to conduct regular border interdictions. These operations include establishing mobile checkpoints on routes criminal groups use to avoid the border inspection stations. Agents can then take action against suspects who fail to submit 
an imported materials report, failed to stop at a CDFA inspection station, or took a route designed to avoid the inspection stations. During the first week of November, Cal Recycle and its enforcement partners conducted operations at two locations. As a result, agents impounded four 53-foot tractor trailers and one cargo van full of empty beverage containers. They arrested five suspects, and agents seized over 36,000 pounds of material worth an estimated 58,000 in the California redemption value. So far in 2021, California Department of Justice agents reported the execution of 17 search warrants, 26 arrests, the seizure of more than 208,000 pounds of aluminum, plastic, and glass beverage containers. Their work has helped prevent a loss to the fund estimated at $304,000. CalRecycle encourages anyone with information about fraudulent activity to call our fraud tip line at 1-866-CAN-LOAD. You can also, visit, also email our investigations at calrecycle.ca.gov. That's an update on our enforcement and we are really happy with our partners and will continue to to do this important work. Some important announcements coming up for the Beverage Container Recycling Program is on December 1st, we will be releasing our per pound rates for 2022. Uh, this month, we will be releasing our curbside supplemental payments. And also in December, we will be releasing our 2020 Recycling Cost Survey. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Amy. Meeting California's climate and waste reduction goals would not be possible without the hard work of our cities and our counties. They're responsible for implementing the local programs to use less, recycle more, and meet state environmental protection standards. CalRecycle is responsible for overseeing how well jurisdictions are implementing these programs. Staff does this by conducting site visits, analyzing documentation, and through reviews of jurisdictions annual reports, which include disposal information and self-assessments of their programs. CalRecycle conducts more intensive jurisdictional reviews every two or four years, depending on the jurisdiction's past performance. The department also has the authority to conduct any time reviews to make sure that cities and counties are in compliance with mandatory commercial recycling and mandatory commercial organics recycling requirements. Deputy Director Matt Hedigan is back now with results of CalRecycle's latest compliance investigations. Matt? Thank you, Linda. Uh, most California cities and counties are successfully implementing their commercial recycling and commercial organics recycling programs. But when our reviews find gaps in those programs, we work with jurisdictions to get their programs back on track. Through the annual review process, local assistance and market development branch staff did identify implementation gaps for the unincorporated areas of, Riverside, of Imperial County. When the county is while the county is implementing MCR, that's mandatory commercial recycling and mandatory or commercial organic recycling programs, uh, based on the monitoring numbers submitted by the county, there is still a high level of non-compliance among businesses. So these programs exist, but they're not being subscribed to by, by uh, 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 enough businesses. Um, on today's agenda, you can read a, you know, a summary of what CalRecycle identified as the gaps uh, that, and how the county is going to address those gaps. Um, but I'll briefly you know, summarize what the, what the county's plan includes. Um, they're going to be seeking Board of Supervisor approval for a new criteria for certifying haulers, waste haulers, to help meet program requirements, uh, in addition uh, to passing an enforcement ordinance to boost business implementation. They'll be collaborating with the Imperial Valley Resource Management Agency to provide additional education and outreach to regulated businesses, as well as schools that need to sign up for these services. And they'll be following up uh, with, with, uh, with non-compliant businesses um, on a monthly basis to try to get them enrolled in these programs, uh, as well as creating an 
exemption program for eligible businesses. There may be businesses that that aren't signed up for for collection, but don't don't need to be, uh, and, and that it shouldn't be counted against the the county. LAM staff will closely monitor these programs over the next six months, and if the county fails to make adequate progress, it may be referred to our jurisdictional compliance unit for further investigation. Uh, this item has been delegated to me for signing. So. Um, you know, thank you to the hard work of all the cities and counties getting these programs going. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll be monitoring Imperial County. Uh, Linda, back to you. Thanks so much, Matt. Moving on now to our pending solid waste and tire facilities permits. Check out this quick video to see how California facility standards help keep our community safe. Protecting the health of Californians and their land, food, water, and air is a big job. Local, state, and federal agencies play different roles to enforce public health and environmental safety standards. In California, solid waste local enforcement agencies process applications, issue, and enforce permits for solid waste facilities. These include landfills, transfer stations, compost facilities, or similar operations. CalRecycle must verify permits are consistent with state requirements. Permits can only address areas within the authority of local enforcement agencies and CalRecycle. Check out the link below for more detailed information. Emergency waivers allow temporary changes to solid waste permit requirements in response to local or state disasters. Local enforcement agencies may approve the waivers, which are good for up to 120 days and may be extended. CalRecycle must review approved waivers and can condition, limit, suspend, or terminate them. Check out the link for more detailed information. For waste tire facilities, CalRecycle processes applications, issues, and enforces waste tire permits. These include requirements to make sure tires are stored and processed in a way that reduces potential threats from fire and disease-carrying vectors like mosquitoes. Check out the link for more detailed information. CalRecycle is committed to protecting public health and safety by ensuring that California's waste regulations are followed. Branch Chief Paulina Lawrence joins us now with a statewide update on facility permits. Good morning, Paulina. Good morning, Linda. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to start off with um, those um, solid waste facility permits that the department has either issued or concurred since the last public meeting. The department issued on October 26, 2021, a modified solid waste facilities permit, compostable material handling permit for Modesto Co Compost Facility. This facility is located at 7001 Jennings Road in Modesto, which is in Stanislaus County. The facilities permit action was needed by November 3rd, 2021. This facility is within CalRecycle's jurisdiction, acting as um, enforcement agency for that county. Continuing on the, on the agenda from last month is the Universal Waste Systems, Inc. This is a material recovery facility and transfer station. It's located at 9016 North Walk Boulevard in Santa Fe Springs in Los Angeles County. This is a revised solid waste facilities permit. Action is needed by November 23rd, 2021. Also continuing on the agenda is El, El Nido Central Valley Composting Facility. This facility is located at 13757 South Harmon Road in El Nido, which is in Merced County. It's a revised solid waste facilities permit. Action is needed by November 30th, 2021. Also continuing is Eastlake uh, Sanitary Landfill located at 16015 Davis Avenue in Clear Lake which is in Lake County. This is a revised solid waste facilities permit. Action is needed by December 11, 2021. And then also lastly, continuing on from last month is Recology Hay Road, located at 6426 Hay Road in Vacaville, which is in Solano County. This is a revised solid waste facilities permit. Action is needed by December 12, 2021. New to the agenda for this month, is Lost Hills Environmental Waste Facility. It's located at 14045 Holloway Road, Lost Hills, which is in Kern County. This is a revised solid waste facilities permit. Action is needed by December 20th, 
2021. Preliminary view of the permit package indicates the proposed, the following proposed changes. Change in facility name from HM Holloway to Lost Hills Environmental Waste Facility. Increase in operating hours from 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. to 24 hours per day, seven days a week. There's also an increase in permitted tonnage from 2,000 tons per day to 3,753 tons per day. An increase in permitted vehicles from 91 vehicles per day to 313 vehicles per day. There'll be additional solid waste types allowed for disposal and additional material types for alternative daily cover. And lastly, there'll be the addition of a compost activity. Also new to the agenda is Johnson Canyon Sanitary Landfill located at 31400 Johnson Road, Johnson Canyon Road. This is in Gonzales, which is in Monterey County. It's a revised solid waste facilities permit. Action is needed December 27, 2021. Preliminary review of the permit package indicates the following proposed changes. Increase in the permitted maximum tonnage from 1,574 tons per day to 1,694 tons per day through 2025. This is phased in increases beginning in 2026 in accordance to the following schedule. January 1st, 2026 through December 31st, 2030. This would be 1,826 tons per day. Then January 1st, 2031 through December 31st, 2035. This um, increase would then be 1,966 tons per day. And then lastly, January 1st, 2036 through December 31st, 2040, the increase with them would be 2,118 tons per day. There will also be the removal of the permitted traffic volume limit of 265 vehicles per day on the permit cover page. And instead, um, they will be updating the permitted traffic volume to state traffic will be regulated as per Title 14, California Code of Regulations, Section 17418.3, and Title 27, California Code of Regulations, Section 20860. There will also be an increase in the disposal design capacity from 13,834,328 cubic yards to 18,500,000. Yards. There'll be an increase in the permitted composting area from five acres to 12.5 acres, a change in the composting design capacity from 26,000 tons to 57,276 cubic yards. There'll be an increase in the disposal maximum elevation from 506 feet mean sea level to 540 feet mean sea level, increase in the estimated closure year from 2055 to 2066, removal of permit conditions that are obsolete or dupl duplicative of existing regulations and or the monitoring program. And then lastly, updates to the facilities joint technical document. The last thing I'd like to go over is those waivers that the department has received since last month. We received one waiver from Tulare County. Visalia, this is for Visalia disposal site. On November 2nd, 2021, the Tulare County Health and, Hum and Human Services Agency, local enforcement, local enforcement agency, otherwise known as the LEA, granted an emergency waiver for the following, the origin of waste, rate of inflow for storage, transfer, processing, or disposal of waste, type and moisture contact of solid waste, hours of facility operation, and storage time before transfer, processing, or disposal of non-hazardous waste. And this is until March 2nd, 2022. This is due to the emergency resulting from the KMP and the windy fires. That's all I have for this month. Back to you, Linda. Thank you so much, Paulina. Before we open it up to the public comments this morning, we'd like to remind everyone that you can find more information on each of the agenda items we discussed today by visiting the CalRecycle homepage, selecting public meetings, and then clicking on today's date to download the meeting agenda. And that's where you can find more in-depth information on today's items, as well as links and contact information should you have any questions. We are working to make the process easier for you, but this is how you can access that information for the time being. And now let's send it over to Zoe Heller and Maria West to address the public comments this morning. Uh, 
All right. Thanks so much, Linda. We so far have um, five public comments that have come in, and I'll go ahead and start with reading the first one. The first one's from John Davis with the Mojave Desert and Mountain Recycling Authority, and um, the subject is SB 1383 local grants, and the comment is, the Mojave Desert and Mountain Recycling Authority supports the recommendations in Agenda Item 2 to provide minimum grants and allocate the remainder on a per capita basis. We recommend that the per capita grants be adjusted to benefit low and moderate income residents who will be disproportionately financially impacted by increased program costs. For example, if the 100% per capita allocation were $1, a community at 50% of the statewide median would receive $1.50. Thank you for considering this more equitable approach. Matt, would you like to respond? Sure. Um, it, it, yeah, I, I think that's a that's a valid comment. Um, thank you for bringing that to us. You know, that's um, it, 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 we um, we really are focusing on the most food insecure communities right now, and I think there will be a lot of overlap um, uh, between those those groups. Um, and so, right, that's definitely the spirit uh, of what we're trying to accomplish with this new um, ranking system that we've proposed. So, uh, yeah, thank you, thank you for the comment. Thanks, Matt. And if you wouldn't mind staying on, um, the next question is also related to the SB thirteen eighty three local assistance grant. And this um, comment is from Ashley Stratikis with the city of Encinitas. And her comment reads, hello, I would like to see activities and materials related to canvassing slash door-to-door -door outreach included in eligible projects. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's great input. Um, I believe that outreach activities may be capped at a certain percentage of the grant, but it is considered an eligible, uh, an eligible expense. And so, um, yeah, thank you for making that comment, and I'll, I'll be sure it gets passed on to the staff that's working on that program. Thanks, Matt. And one more just came in from Ashley, so I'm going to go ahead and read that one before turning it over to Maria for the next two. And um, this question is also related to the 1383 local grant assistance, and also from Ashley with the city of Ontario. <coughs> the comment is, how about providing eligibility for incentives such as rewards for recycling or having low contamination or something else that power cycle deems more appropriate? That, that's interesting. I mean, the idea behind this funding is to to give local governments the tools they need to implement, right? The, the, there's a significant new cost um, on local governments, and trying to trying to alleviate that. Um, it, it had not occurred to me that the, the local government government may want to pass those funds on to individual um, uh, businesses or or, or customers. Um, in the form of incentives, but um, you know that's why we we put out this call for public comments. So thank you for bringing that idea to us. Um, you know, I'll, I'll pass it on to the team that's working on that. Thanks so much, Matt. I'll turn it over to Maria for the next two questions. Thanks so much, Zoe. Our next question comes from from Resource Recovery Coalition of California, and the question is, can you please share the email for local governments to respond to SB 1383 local assistance funding? You may. The answer is you may send your input to grants at calrecycle.ca.gov by this Friday, November 19th. Thanks. The next question is also from Resource Recovery Coalition of California, and their question is, when will the slides presented by Matt Hennigan be available? The slides are now available. So just for general information, a recording of today's public meeting will be posted shortly on CalRecycle's YouTube page. That usually takes us about a day to get a, a ADA compliant, and then that's available. Uh, right now, Matt Hennigan's PowerPoint is available as part of the presentation on CalRecycle's website in the document section of the public notice page for today's meeting. That's where you find today's agenda. So those are the answers for those two. Thanks, Maria. I saw that um, one more question just came in, so I'll go ahead and read it. Um, this next question is um, from Marin Sanitary Service um, from Ruben, and Ruben's comment is, the bottom of the slides for the presentation is covered by the um, quotation submit questions to www.calrecycle.ca.gov backslash public comments under quotations banner, and it blocks the information at the bottom of the slides. 
I suggest you move it below the slides in between the date and calendar cycles logo. If there was tons, parentheses, no pun intended, under parentheses, of information given today, will this meeting be available to be viewed again at a later time? If yes, how can someone view it? Ruben, thanks so much for that comment. Um, noted, um, and we'll, we'll take a look at that for future meetings. And I believe um, Maria just responded as to uh, when this meeting will be available, but I'll turn it over to her to, um, to make that point one more time. Yes, so today's meeting will be available on our YouTube page, and that should be available in about 24 hours. We just take a little while to make it ADA compliant. Additionally, we are launching a page this week that will also feature today's meeting, all the shorter videos from today's meeting, and then all the videos from the last few months of meetings and the shorter videos um, pulled out of those as well. So we'll have a public meeting archive page available on our website and the web team should have that up by the end of the week. Oh, you're muted, Zoe. I just said thank you so much, Maria, and that does it for our public comments for today. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, ladies. Uh, just wanted to say thank you to everyone who participated in the public meeting today. Uh, we hope that you enjoy the new format designed to make communication accessible, inclusive, and as relevant as possible. Rachel, I just saw you pop on. So did you have something that you wanted to add? No, I just wanted to um, do what you were doing much more eloquently than I could do, Linda, which was just thank everybody for attending today. And there was a lot of information in today's meeting. So please, please do reach out to Cal Recycle on any questions that you have about any of our grant programs or any of the other information that was shared today. Um, we, as you saw, all the um, executive staff team here at Cal Recycle is happy to help facilitate um, answering those questions as uh, as we can be helpful. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us if we can, if we can um, speak further on these points. But thank you to Linda and the OPA team for facilitating this uh, meeting today, so thank you. Thanks, and we welcome your feedback. Um, so feel free to leave us a comment on the public comment portal page. And in the meantime, have a great rest of your morning and week, and we'll see you back next month in December. Goodbye, everyone.